Hello, and welcome to the Book of Heroes podcast. This is a weekly show dedicated to helping you get better at Storybook Brawl. I'm your host, Sydney, and today we're going to be talking about the fates, how to be successful with this uh, complicated but powerful hero. So to start off, I did want to mention we did have a new patch come out last week, but I'll be honest, I have not had a lot of time to play. I've been on vacation. I had a nice work trip to Vermont and New Hampshire. I got to see some of my mom's family there, and then I got to visit my friend in Maine for a couple days, which was really fantastic. But unfortunately, I didn't get in a lot of storybook brawl during that time. I don't want to give you all incomplete advice. So I'm going to postpone the discussion of the new metagame until I've had a little more time to figure it out. Instead, I'm going to cover a topic I feel pretty confident about because it hasn't changed much with the new patch, and that's the fates. But one more thing before I get into that, I want to follow up from last week's episode. I covered all of the cards that I could find lore of, but a couple of listeners pointed out some references that I hadn't caught in the game. So Eric F. on Discord pointed out that Sleeping Princess is Sleeping Beauty, of course. Honestly, I can't believe I missed this one. It's pretty obvious. I'm a little sad that True Love's Kiss does not create the Awoken Princess, but this is the world we live in. He also pointed out a few other cards. Shepherd's Sling references the biblical story of David and Goliath. David, of course, was a shepherd and used a sling to take down the giant Goliath. Treants are a reference to Ints from Tolkien. So the most famous character would be Treebeard, of course. Now, the reason they're called Treants and not Ints, I believe, is because Dungeons & Dragons tried to publish its first monster manual with creatures called Ints. They got sued, so they changed them very slightly. The Scion of the Storm, formerly known as the Storm King, is a reference to the storm mechanic from Magic the Gathering. In Magic, storm decks cast lots and lots of spells, and of course the Storm King is all about casting lots of spells. As a side note, I'm kind of disappointed in the name Scion of the Storm. I know they couldn't keep the Storm King because then the character would be a royal, but the Storm King sounds a lot cooler in my opinion. The art for Needle-Nosed Daggers represents the game Fruit Ninja. You can see that there's a fruit being chopped in half, which is a pretty clever one. Nicely spotted Eric, though I still don't understand what Needle-Nosed Daggers are. And lastly, Gingerbread Party is a reference to the story of Hansel and Gretel. They have stumbled upon a gingerbread house in the woods. Nice finds all around, Eric. 10 out of 10. Gold star. Vrumen on both Discord and Twitter also commented and had some... and satisfied my curiosity on two characters that I thought were original to Storybook Brawl. Aeon references the devices that perform magic in Brandon Sanderson's book Elantris. And Sporko is actually a reference to Orko, who is a wizard from He-Man and other shows in the Masters of the Universe stories. I am so happy to find that out. I thought that Sporko was just something they made up, but if you look at the art for the character Orko, you'll see it's that sort of faceless wizard that totally matches the character in Storybook Brawl. So thanks for pointing those out, Vrumen. Very satisfying to know where those characters came from. All right, let's talk about the Fates. So the Fates is one of the eight starting heroes, so it will always be offered to one of the eight players in a game, and you don't have to purchase it with fairy dust. And it says, your upgraded characters have plus three, plus three, and the first character you buy is destined to upgrade. So that second ability, destined to upgrade, is actually pretty complicated. The way that works is when you first buy a character, a copy of that character will appear in your first shop each round until you have upgraded that character, which generally means that you've collected three of them. If you have one of these characters in your shop and you lock the shop, you will get another copy next round. So, for example, if you buy Blind Mouse on the first turn of the game, 2.0, on turn 2.1, there will be a Blind Mouse in your shop. Maybe you take a Crafty instead. If you lock the shop, in the next round, there will be two Blind Mice in the shop. 
the one from last round and the one from this one. And there's also a chance that blind mice could just appear regularly in one of your other shop slots. So you could get quite a lot of blind mice if you just kept walking the shop and kept buying other characters. The Fates' ability also skips quest characters. So usually this comes up with Cinderella. If you take Cinderella on 2.0 and Blind Mouse on 2.1, you will get a Blind Mouse in your shop on 2.2, not a Cinderella. Similarly, if you acquire a character through the spell Roll the Dice, which selects a character randomly from your shop, that character will not count as the faded character. You have to actually buy it without that spell. The last nuance here is if you transform your faded character, which can happen generally one of four ways, polywoggle, lonely prints, which can apply to one of four cards, polywoggle, which slays to transform into a character, lonely prints, which transforms into frog prints when you buy another royal, Shard of the Ice Queen, which transforms a good character into an evil character, or True Love's Kiss, which transforms a character into another character level higher, you will get that transformed character in the shop going forward. And that only applies to the first character you bought, not any other copies of it. So for example, if you buy a Polywoggle on 2.0 and it slays and turns into Shadow Assassin on 2.1, you will not see a polywoggle in your shop, you will see a shadow assassin instead. So we'll talk about how to use these complicated interactions to your advantage in a moment, but first I wanted to answer the question that I think is on a lot of people's minds. How strong are the fates? And the answer is they're pretty darn good. Looking at the stats from the most recent patch, they're number eight Um on the list of heroes in terms of average win rate, that's out of 39 heroes in the game, so they're in the top quarter of heroes easily. And if you sort it to just include games played by mythic players, the fates actually moves up to number five. So what that tells me is not only are the fates good, but they're actually stronger if they're played by a more experienced player who's presumably familiar with their abilities that is what I hope I can give to you all from this episode today. The Fates have been topping the stats ever since their ability was changed to include a de- character destined to upgrade. And I think the reason for this is pretty straightforward. There are a couple of characters available at level 2 where getting a early triple can give you a huge advantage. But even if you aren't able to find one of those characters in your first shop... The Fate still offers you a lot of early strength. Plus three, plus three to a character is pretty huge. And it's easy to get a level two treasure on turn 2.2, which most heroes don't have access to. Giving you extra selection in your shop is pretty valuable. That lets you take advantage of your gold more effectively on those early turns and better use the shrink spell to bolster your economy. And Unlike some heroes that are only strong in the early game, the Fates' ability can use to help you throughout the game. Often in the mid-game, you'll have half your team composed of upgraded characters, so the Fates is giving out plus 9, plus 9, or plus 12, plus 12 in abilities. That's better than Krampus or Mrs. Claus. Plus, you can pick and choose what characters you upgrade, and if you pick characters that benefit more from the extra stats, characters with range, slay stuff like Friendly Spirit or Wombats in Disguise, you can really push that ability to the maximum level. So the Fates are really good, and knowing how to play them well can make them even better. Let's talk about how to play the Fates. And I think the first question there is, what character do you pick on turn 2.0? This is a really important choice. It determines what character is being destined to upgrade, And I've divided these characters, as I want to do, into five categories. Characters that are really great, picks that don't count toward your selection, effectively giving you a second chance, options that are at least decent, characters that are playable if there's no other option, and then characters that you really kind of want to avoid picking unless you don't have another option. So... I think there's two characters that are really awesome for the Fates to pick on turn 2.0. And the first one 
I think the best overall is Blind Mouse. It's just a 2-2, but finding three blind mice gives you a level 4 treasure instead of a level 2 treasure. This is clearly amazing. Finding a early level 4 treasure can really supercharge your game. It's one of the best things that heroes like Wonder Waddle can do, and the Fates lets you virtually guarantee this. I would take Blind Mouse over any other option. Now, in the interest of time, I'm not going to go over every single level 4 treasure, but I did want to call out some of the ones that are strongest in the early game. Forking Rod is incredibly powerful because almost all the spells you're buying cost two or less. Doubling those can help you win fights from some of the buff spells, really improve your economy from stuff like shrink spells or any mini money mo. And having a forking rod makes it much easier to pick up wizards, familiars, and spell weavers and have them perform well. Fool's Gold is really powerful. Getting four gold in the early game every turn is absolutely huge. It'll give you a major economy advantage. And even though you can't cast spells, you can't get ahead with XP spells, you can still fill out the rest of your treasure slots by rolling for upgraded characters and just build a really strong board early on. Horn of Olympus is a treasure that's might not look like it's good in the early game because in order for supporting your front row characters to matter you have to have supports and not every build has them but what i found is horn of olympus is actually quite strong if you did it on turn 2.2 even something as simple as picking up a mad mem can make a huge difference to your front line and even a character like good witch of the north is tremendously improved by not having to play it in slot 5 to affect your characters that are likely to attack you can put your good witch in slot six or seven and you can build an entire good front line same thing with wicked witch of the south or even baby root can be quite effective at just making your team way more survivable and this treasure gives you great options once you go into level four you can start taking sporkos and lady of the lakes to really massively improve your team or you can go into slay with Riverwish mermaid and then later baba yaga Horn of Olympus makes that strategy work so much better. So Forking Rod, Horn of Olympus, Fool's Gold, those are the treasures that I would prioritize. Ones that I don't like, Reduplicator is really hard to make use of early on because you're not likely to have a character that summons a token that you really care about. Doubling your Black Cat's not powerful. Deck of Many Things casts a spell every round, so you might be excited by that, but until you hit level 4, the only two spells it casts are Earthquake and Falling Stars. Neither of these are particularly strong, and Falling Stars can actually hurt you. So unless you have, like, two Wizards Familiars or something already, I would not take the deck of many things. Sky Castle can be good, maybe if there's some Royals in your shop, but really not that impressive an effect, and sometimes you just don't find any Royals to take advantage of Sky Castle's ability for several turns. And lastly, Summoning Portal is not powerful enough unless you're maybe getting this on 3.0 for some reason and there's like two princess peeps in your shop or something. There are a lot of treasures in the middle there that can be situationally good. You know, Gloves of Thieving, Coin of Charon, Moonsong Horn, Six of Shields, Ring of Rage, all totally solid options, but sort of in the middle. Lastly, I wanted to mention that you can get kind of crazy with blind mouse. If you only buy two blind mice out of your shop and then you just keep locking your shop, you can build up six blind mice between your board and your shop, which can let you get two level four treasures at the same time. This usually comes at a pretty significant cost because you can't roll your shop, so you're limited to buying whatever characters are showing up in the spots that the blind mice are not occupying, and this often results in you losing some fights. So I wouldn't go for this unless you're getting a bunch of blind mice in your shop already. Like if you have one blind mouse on board and then two in your shop on 2.1, I would maybe consider going down this route and trying to hold out for two blind mice triples. I promise I won't take this long with all of the level two characters, but blind mouse is a big part of why the fates is successful. The other part of why the Fates is successful that really shows off the power of this hero is Polyloggle. So after my episode with Aaron Gertler a couple weeks ago, I have started taking Polyloggle more highly in general. And while I think it is a reasonable option on most heroes, 
Poliwoggle is actually really good on the fates. So the way this works is you buy your Poliwoggle on turn 2.0, and occasionally, maybe, you know, 25% of the time or something, it will actually get a slight. You'll attack first into your opponent, Sherwood, sure shot or something. In this case, you're set, because you've now got a level 3 character, and you've got another level 3 character in your shop that you can buy on 2.1, and then you can get the triple on 2.2, or you can buy something else and get the triple on 3.0. Either way, you're getting a level 3 treasure ahead of schedule, and even though not every level 3 character is amazing right when you get it, a lot of the ones that aren't get much better with the plus 3 plus 3 buff. For example, for example, triply with that buff becomes an 11-11, which you can boost with treasures or supports. Darkwood Creeper becomes a 3-9 that's buffing your entire team. And then there's the really amazing option, stuff like Prized Pig or Brave Princess on 2.1 that just sets you up for a huge amount of success. One other thing I should mention here is that this is actually a way to make a questing character your character that's destined to upgrade. So if you get a Princess White or a Brave Princess, you can buy two of that character, but I would not recommend buying three because that will result in just tripling the character normally you'll get one treasure, but you won't be able to complete two quests. If you just buy two copies of the character, then you'll have two quests that you can work toward, which sets you up to get two level three treasures. Normally, I don't think Princess White is amazing. On turn 2.1, she's pretty darn impressive, and you're pretty happy to buy dwarves if they're starting off with plus two, plus two to their stats. Now, most of the time, though, on turn 2.0, your Polywoggle will not slay. In that case, my recommendation is that you buy a separate character on turn 2.1. You, you lock your shop. You get another polywoggle in it. On 2.2, there should be two polywoggles in your shop. But you don't actually need to buy them. Instead, you can buy other characters. So while a 1-1 one, one polywoggle is probably holding you back a little bit, you probably lose a couple fights because you have a 1-1 one, one polywoggle. You'll at least be able to buy stronger characters to give you some abilities in a fight. The turn you want to upgrade your Polywoggle, if you don't get that first slay, is turn 3.0. And the great thing about this is, that an upgrade Polywoggle on the Fates is actually a 5-5. A 5-5 has a really good chance to slay against an opposing board, which means that on turn 4.1, you are very likely to have a level 4 upgraded character. That is nuts. It will really set you up for success. Depending on what that character is, you can build around it. There's lots of options. Just even to name some of the weaker characters, upgraded Fairy Godmother is going to make you unbeatable in combat. An upgraded Greedy is going to generate a couple of gold. And even an upgraded Copycat, you can start pairing with Wretched Mummy or other Last Breath characters. The best part is, if you transform your Polywoggle into a level 4 character you don't particularly want, you can just keep it around for a couple turns. It'll still probably win some fights because of the plus 3 plus 3 bonus. And then you can cast a True Love's Kiss on it. And now you have a level 5 character. It's probably still turn like 3.2 or 4.0 or something. And you've got another shot at having a character that will just dominate the board and win you a bunch of fights. I think I gave an example of hitting an upgraded Great Pumpkin King through chaining two, two True Love's Kisses. That was really impressive, but I don't think that's even the best possible outcome. You could get a Lancelot or a Hercules and get a very early treasure plus a massive character. While Polywald was a little bit risky, Plain Fates makes it much less risky because you're very likely to get that level 4 upgraded character, and at the baseline that's going to set you up for success. I think that Blind Mice is slightly more reliable in that sometimes you do hit a character that's a little disappointing off your Polywoggle Slay, but this is, in my experience, the second best option for Fates. Okay, so if you don't get one of these characters, in my experience, the next best thing, if it's available, is to take a character that's effectively a reroll. So if you take Cinderella on 2.0, you get the option to let your shop roll, and you get another shot at letting your shop re-roll and finding one of these options as your next faded character. Similarly, casting Roll the Dice, which selects a random character from your shop, gives you another option. Now, Cinderella is definitely better. I would pick her over Roll the Dice, 
because she becomes a 7-7 with Fates' ability, which is quite strong, even if you have to wait a couple turns for it. But either way, because of the basically explosive potential of Blind Mice and Polywaddle, I believe it is correct to take a Cinderella or roll the dice over any other character. Now, if after you take your Cinderella or roll the dice, there's some other option, good options in the shop, and we'll talk about some of those in a second, I would lock the shop and just let that one free slot fill in. If the rest of the shop is really disappointing, then of course you want to let it roll. So getting into that next tier of options, the sort of okay options that take advantage of the Fates' power but just aren't quite as strong. The first one here is probably a little controversial. It's Humpty Dumpty. So of course, Humpty Dumpty is a 7-7. It's going to win you some fights in the early game most likely. But it's also fragile. You'll lose it eventually. The reason we're interested in it as the Fates is because of Easter Egg. Combining three Humpty Dumpties gives you a treasure, which gives your upgraded characters plus three plus three, and says when you win a brawl, give your surviving characters plus one plus one permanently. So this is a really strong combination. The Fates already gives your upgraded characters plus three plus three, so you end up with an upgraded Humpty Dumpty that's actually a 20-20. It's likely to survive the next couple of fights, so it'll actually get boosts, And if you put it in the front line, for example, you might be able to play some ranged characters in the back line or something that will also get the boosts from Easter Egg. If you're worried about the upgraded Humpty Dumpty dying, you can always hit it with True Love's Kiss or Shard of the Ice Queen, which will preserve its upgraded status, but make it so you can actually put it back together again. And even once it's dead, your upgraded characters will still be getting plus six plus six from the Easter Egg, and when you win fights, they will give that additional bonus I've said before, I think Easter Egg is the strongest level 2 treasure if you just got to pick it out of the normal selection, and the Fates makes this much more reliable to acquire. So why don't I have this in the great options category? Well, frankly, I think that's just because it's really risky. If you're playing in a tournament, or maybe just at the mythic level, your opponents are going to have pretty strong boards. And so it's not that reliable that you're going to be able to keep your Humpty Dumpties alive. If your Humpty Dumpty breaks on the second round, let's say, you're pretty sad. If your Humpty Dumpty breaks right after you've assembled Easter Egg, you've probably lost the game. You've put yourself really far behind. Now, is that super likely? No. But people who are picking strong heroes who know how to manage their early game such that they have a really strong board can sometimes dish out 20 damage to your upgraded Humpty Dumpty. I think talking to Aaron a couple weeks ago also changed my opinion on this a little bit. He really doesn't value Humpty Dumpty at all because of that risk. And after thinking about that, I've definitely shifted my opinion in that direction. So I don't think this is the right pick if you're playing competitively against strong players. Unless the other options are just terrible or in your situation where you need to make a high placement. For example, sometimes the tournament structure will work out so that only a first or second place finish will qualify you for the next stage. That said, this is probably works better if you're playing against slightly weaker opponents. So maybe if you're still working your way up to Mythic, this could be a little bit stronger. Or if you're just looking to have fun and you're fine with taking a risk of losing out. This can be really powerful and it's really satisfying when it works. So there are a couple things you want to keep in mind when you're going for Easter egg. First of all, don't be afraid to put Humpty Dumpty at risk. If you have a 2-2 and a Humpty Dumpty on 2.1, you probably want to put the Humpty Dumpty in first position. Yes, that means he's attacking into something, but you want him to be able to potentially double trade with your opponent's stuff rather than your opponent's 3-3 eating your 2-2 and then getting a shot in at Humpty as well. The second piece of that is that don't be afraid to bench your Humpty Dumpties. As the Fates, you can afford to lose a fight or two. Getting plus 3 plus 3 to your upgraded characters or plus 6 plus 6 with the Easter Egg will let you win some fights later on, meaning that you can afford to drop to, you know, 30 HP sometimes during level 2. If you're playing against a hero you know has a strong early game, someone like Fallen Angel on 2.2, or maybe just Peter Pants, who might have picked up a white sag or something, you can just put your Humpty Dumpties on the bench, play a tiny board, and take your 5 damage or whatever it is. (laughs) Last thing, Humpty Dumpty's best friend is Baby Root. Giving him that additional 3 health means that he can often trade with 1 or 2 additional characters on your opponent's side. 
So if you're buying Humpty Dumpties, make sure you're buying Baby Roots to go with them. All right, going through the other characters that are pretty decent options, Happy Little Tree is not incredibly strong. Another one where I've changed my evaluation a bit after talking to Aaron Gertler. But getting plus three attack and health on your upgraded Happy Little Tree is really strong. Having something like a 510 or 512 on turn 2.2 will win you some fights, and you can look for Darkwood Creepers at level 3 to boost your upgraded Happy Little Tree further. This is one where I might not buy a Happy Little Tree on 2.2. I would just keep the shop locked because I want to buy something stronger than a 1-1. You can't afford to lose fights, but there's no reason to do so needlessly, and getting the additional plus 2 health from having the second Happy Little Tree in your comp for longer isn't usually as impactful as saving 3 HP by playing a stronger character on 2.1. Wizards Familiar is interesting. So you'll notice some overlap in this list of characters with the ones that are good for Gwen's knighthood ability. The thing about Wizards Familiar is that it's a 1-1, and while once you have it upgraded, it's going to be great. It's going to scale and stay in your comp for a long time. It's also losing you some early fights, so and it's not really giving you anything past a big character. So it's sort of a trade-off. I'm much more interested in buying a Wizards Familiar if there is a free roll or Genie's Wish in my shop on 2.0. I can either cast the free roll that turn or lock for the Genie's Wish, and that will buff my Wizards Familiars that I'm buying to the point where they can actually trade with my opponent's characters. Kitty Cut Purse is interesting. So this is sort of down the polywoggle path where it's a character that's quite bad on its base stats, a 1-1 that has to slay, not amazing. But a 5-5 that whenever it slays you get 2 gold is quite good. So not the best option because you won't be keeping it in composition forever, but it does give you sort of a more fragile version of like a prized pig. Notably, this is another case where I would not buy the second Kitty Cuppers on 2.1. I would walk the shop and I would buy some other character. I think Labyrinth Minotaur is probably the best one to pair with Kitty Cuppers because a 2-1 can actually slay things and is likely to trade. The last two characters on the, you know, kind of decent list are Crafty and Lonely Prince, and they're on this list for the same reason, which is stats. So, Getting an upgraded Crafty on 2.2, you have one treasure. That's an 11-11. That often trades for like three characters on your opponent's side. And it gets better as you fill out your other treasure slots, which you're probably interested in doing anyway. You'll be working your way up to a 1919 that can stay in your composition for quite a while. Now, all this gives you is stat, so it's not the best option, but it'll be perfectly fine if you pick it out of a weaker shop. The most important thing with Crafty is that when you upgrade it, usually on 2.2, you actually take a treasure and don't skip for two gold. You might be tempted to because you want that two gold to fill out your board, but you really want your Crafty to be an 11-11 as well. Lonely Prince is a 1-1, so I probably wouldn't buy this unless the other two characters were really bad. Now, if there's a Royal in the same shop, it's pretty good because you buy your 5-5, and the next turn, you can buy your Cinderella or Sherwood Sure Shot. And if it's a Sherwood Sure Shot, I would consider selling it and buying that second Frog Prince in your shop because that gives you two five fives. That's really strong. And then once you've got the third one, it'll upgrade to a 13-13. Basically, this is just a way to get a solid advantage in the early game. By the way, this is one where you don't necessarily want to buy the third one on 2.2. If there's other decent characters in the shop, sometimes you'll want to pick those up before you get your 13-13, because 2 five fives is already pretty good on 2.2. So that's all the characters that are, you know, kind of decent. Next category of characters, I'm going to run through a little more quickly. And these are the ones that are just okay if you have no better options. So Baby Dragon, it's a 9-6 flying character when it's upgraded. That's pretty good, but it's not staying in your comp for too long, so it's just a nice combination of stats. Baby Root, Fanny, and Mad Mim are all supports that benefit from being actually pretty strong. The disadvantage of running those early support characters is your backline is weak, but if your backline is a 3-9 or a 7-7, these are also characters you're rotating out later, so not that exciting. Sherwood Sure Shot seems like it would be good. When it's upgraded, it's a 7-5 range character. But the issue with this is, while that's 
quite strong. It's kind of needy when it comes to position. You you have to put your Sherwood Sure Shot usually in position five. And I find that it's not really any better than Crafty or Frog Prince at winning you fights, but it also is something that you'll be rotating out more quickly than those other characters, which you can keep in slots, you know, four that you're not really using. Sherwood Sure Shot is pretty bad if you put it in slot four. So that's been my experience. You can definitely still pick Sherwood Sure Shot. It'll win you some early fights. Just don't expect too much. Lastly, there's Rainbow Unicorn. So this is similar to what I was saying with Happy Little Tree. An upgraded Rainbow Unicorn on the Fates is a 513, and it gives your other good characters plus two health. That's pretty solid, but it falls off after level three, and it's hard to make this into anything more than some stats, so that's why I have it in the just kind of okay category. Lastly, there's some characters that you really don't want to pick on the Fates unless you just have a shop of three bad options. They are Bad Billy Gruff, Black Cat, Golden Chicken, Labyrinth Minotaur, Tiny, and sort of an honorable mention to the spell Shard of the Ice Queen. Bad Billy Gruff is kind of awkward when it comes to stats. Uh, you know, a 7 will win you some fights, but whatever. You're not doing anything special with it. And frankly, it's not, even on like turn 3.2, it's not that impressive. Black Cat is not a great character to upgrade because it's only 5-5 five five and it still dies into 2-2. Two two. Golden Chicken is sort of an interesting example. It's a 7-7 seven seven when it's upgraded, which is the baseline, but its chief function is to be sold. You don't really want to sell your Golden Chicken until you have a full board, which takes longer with the Fates. So this is just another character that doesn't really do anything. Labyrinth Minotaur and Tiny only have 5 health when they're upgraded with the Fates which means they're often likely to trade one for one and can't really take advantage of the bonus. Shard of the Ice Queen, as I mentioned, can transform your character that's fated to upgrade, but I don't think it's a good idea to cast this on a level two good character. The worst options there are probably Rainbow Unicorn and Sherwood Sure Shot, and sure, these aren't great, but your best hope for Shard of the Ice Queen is to hit a Kitty Cuppers, which is not going to be that impressive, and you are... Really sad if you turn one of those good characters into bad Billy Gruff, Black Cat, or Labyrinth Minotaur, which are all things that you don't really want to see three of in your shop. So Shard of the Ice Queen, not really recommended. Last thing is a question that I certainly wondered myself when I started playing the Fates. Is it appropriate to roll the shop on turn 2.0 if you just don't find anything? Now, obviously... Unless you have a free roll, that means you're not buying a character on 2.0. You're doing your best skip impression. And I think the answer to this is no. Now, as I mentioned, the Fates is pretty good at sort of making up for lost time with its plus three, plus three to an upgraded character. But most shops have at least one character, even if it's something like one of the supports that is going to be pretty decent. And even those worst options, something like Bad Billy Gruff, by the way, sorry, I'm contractually obligated to say the name every time. You know, it's still some stats. It's still a level two treasure. It's not the end of the world. And there's really just not that big a reason to give up your level two treasure. I would maybe consider this if like my only options were Labyrinth Minotaur, Tiny, and Black Cat or something. But I think especially in something like a tournament setting, you're likely to just get run over if you decide to play as Skip instead of the Fates. So I just spent a lot of time talking about all of the character options for level two Fates, but we should talk a little bit about what you do with this hero after that point. Oftentimes your upgraded character or the treasure that you get from it is something that you can build around. Polywaldo is the biggest example of this, but Having a happy little tree, a wizard's familiar, those characters can push you in certain directions. Maybe you try to pair the happy little tree with Darkwood Creeper and Hardwood Elder. Maybe you try to cast some spells, pick up some monster books at level four to boost your wizard's familiar. Or maybe you pick up a treasure that you can build around a little bit, something like Monster Manual. Now, obviously, you're plus three, plus three bonus to any upgraded character. So the Fates definitely does want to roll for triples a little more than other characters would. You're also a little more interested in quests, but I wouldn't get crazy with this. Even the bonus from your very first upgraded character will get you pretty far, and you should be fine to just sort of play a 
normal mid-game upgrading characters where you see the opportunity. One thing that is really good with the Fates is True Love's Kiss. Oftentimes you'll upgrade a character and it'll be, you know, a 2-2 that's a 7-7, but you don't really have a use for that. Once you get to later in the game, upgrading that character via True Love's Kiss gives you some great options. For example, if you have a Cinderella or Blind Mice hanging out, you can hit them with the True Love's Kiss later and boom, now you have something like a Wretched Mummy that can stay in your comp for a lot longer that takes much better advantage of the plus three plus three. I mentioned that Shard of the Ice Queen isn't so great on level two characters as the Fates, but sometimes you'll have like an upgraded level three. Sharding that can sometimes be good. For example, if you're playing Slay, turning your turning your upgraded White Stag into an upgraded Shadow Assassin is a pretty good deal, especially since you start with that plus three plus three upgraded bonus. And Mix a Whistle similarly can do the same thing. The Fates can play most archetypes. The one it's not so good at is animals or summon focus builds, since the summon characters don't get the bonus from being upgraded. But you know, you, you can play those if you have to. Maybe you polywoggled into a hungry, hungry hippocampus or something. What you do want to do is seek out characters that will benefit from your plus three plus three upgraded bonus. The ones that stand out to me are the Blast Breath characters, Wretched Mummy, Friendly Spirit, Tweedledee, Wombats in Disguise. I also think that the level 4 support characters, Lady the Lake and Sporko, benefit a lot from this because having 3 attack can quickly cause them to fall off, but getting up to 10 attack with the triple plus the Fates bonus is a lot more powerful and means you can put your Sporko in position 5. A 9-9 Sporko is much less likely to waste its turn when it attacks. One more thing to cover here, which is it was all a dream. So occasionally you'll want to dream out of fates in the later turns. Plus 3, plus 3 is not a big bonus at level 6. But it's actually more interesting when you are either playing Mask or cast it was all a dream normally and you see fates as an option. This will let you pick characters that are not level 2 as your character that's fated to upgrade. So that's super cool. This can be incredibly powerful at level 6 in particular. And effectively, you want to treat this ability a bit like the treasure hand of Midas. So if you're dreaming into fates, you might hold out a little bit, try and find a keystone character like an Ashwood Elm or a good boy that fits your composition. And then the... And then the Fates will give you two more copies of that character over the next two turns, which is pretty great. One thing you want to avoid is having your first character that you buy after you switch into Fates being the third character in a set, because that will just instantly complete the Destined to Upgrade part and you don't get any benefit. All right, that is everything I have to cover for today. We talked about some quick lore updates. We talked about the fates, how the some of the unique interactions with having a character be destined to upgrade its strength overall. It's one of the strongest heroes in the game. And then we went through all of the characters that are good to destined to upgrade. The ones to highlight, Blind Mouse and Polywoggle, and then of course you can sort of delay the decision with Cinderella or Roll the Dice. And then, you know, sometimes you end up taking Humpty Dumpty, Happy Little Tree, Wizards Familiar, Kitty Cup Purse, Crafty, or Lonely Prince in the right situation. And there's some other characters that are okay too. Baby Dragon, Baby Root, Fanny, Mad Bam, Rainbow Unicorn, Sherwood Sure Shot. Last week we talked about how to play the later turns as the Fates and what to do when you switch into the Fates with the spell It Was All a Dream. I hope you all learned something from this episode. And as always, I'd love to learn from you. If you want to submit a comment or even a question for me to answer on air, you can do so via our Discord. The link is in the show notes. You can also follow the podcast and potentially tweet at us on Twitter at Book of Heroes SBB, and you can email us at Book of Heroes SBB at gmail.com. If you're looking for our back episodes, you can find them on Book of Heroes.podbean.com or your favorite podcast app. And I will see you all playing Storybook Brawl. My username is Coda305, and I'll talk to you all next week.